Welcome everybody, get settled in. Again, in just a minute, we'll let some people join. Okay, good evening and welcome to tonight's live virtual program. I'm Amber from the Reference Adult Services Department here at the library. Thank you for joining us this evening. I have a few housekeeping items to share before we start the presentation. Tonight's program is scheduled to run until 8 p.m. During the program, all attendees will be muted, so report any technical issues you may have in the chat. During the presentations, chat messages will only be visible to hosts and monitored by me, Howell Library Adult Services. There will be a Q&A session after the presentation. If you have a question, please enter at that time in the chat. We'll address as many audience questions as we can before the program ends. During the Q&A, messages in the chat will be visible to all meeting attendees. This program is being recorded and the recording will be available on the library's YouTube channel soon after this live virtual program. If you did not want your video in the recording, make sure your video is turned off, that there is a red slash to the camera icon in the bottom left corner of your Zoom window. Tonight's presenter is Buddy Morehouse. Buddy is a longtime Livingston County journalist and documentary filmmaker. He was the editor of the Livingston County Daily Press in Argus and its predecessors, the Brighton Argus and the Livingston County Press for 26 years and is currently a blogger for the Livingston Post. He lives in Gregory and he and his wife, Kathy, have four children. Without further ado, I'll turn things over to Buddy. Well, thank you very much, Amber. Um, it's wonderful to be here. This is the first program that I've done um, on this uh, book, so I'm very much looking forward to seeing how this goes here. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen to start with right now. Let me get that ready. And so you can all see Jenny here. Okay, I'm going to uh, assume that everyone can see my screen just fine um, right now. Um, as Amber said, my name is Buddy Morehouse, and I am a, a Livingston County guy. Been here for a long time. I was the editor of the, um, as she said, the editor of the local papers for a lot of years. And for the last um, uh, 12 years or so, I have been uh, doing a few other things. I work for the State Charter School Association. I blog for the Livingston Post. Um, I teach a class on documentary filmmaking at Hillsdale College. Um, I'm uh, also um, excuse me, a documentary filmmaker. And uh, this year I became an author. I wrote my very first book, which is called Murder of an Elvis Girl, Solving the Jenny Maxwell Case. And um, tonight I'm going to just kind of walk you through Jenny's story. Um, I assume that some of you have probably read the book and, and uh, others of you hopefully are, are going to want to read the book after you uh, hear her incredible story. Um, but as I said, I've never written a book before. This is the first one that I've ever done. It was an amazing process, but I'm just gonna walk you through Jenny's story, uh, tell you a little bit about um, her life in Hollywood. I'm gonna talk about the crime, the, the murder that happened um, in 1981, and then kind of the journey that I went through to look into the story, to investigate it, and then to um, coming to write the book after that. So let's get right into Jenny's story right now. Jenny Maxwell was my mom's first cousin. Um, there's the book there. So this is our family here. Um, my grandfather was a man named Elling Jacobson. Jenny's father, Jonas, who became Johnny when he came over to America, that was Jenny's father. And then there was a third uh, Norwegian brother uh, named Harold who also came over from Norway. So Elling, Jonas, and Harold were part of 11 brothers and sisters who grew up in Norway in a tiny little town near Bergen called Meeksvoll. And the, of the, the 11 of them, three of them came over to America. Elling, Jonas, and Harold all came over. Um, Elling, as I said, that was my grandfather. That was my mom's dad. And then Jonas was Jenny's father. So Jenny and my mom were first cousins. Jenny was um, Norwegian through and through. Uh, she was born in 1941 in Brooklyn, New York, but her dad and her mom were both from Norway. They were both uh, Norwegian immigrants who came over here 
from the United States or from Norway to the United States. So that's a picture of Jenny when she was a little girl. And when Jenny was a little girl, she was six years younger than my mom. And that's Jenny and her mom and dad. That's her dad, Jonas, and her mom, Annie, who are both from Norway. This picture was taken sometime probably in the late 1940s. And my mom, who is pictured there with Jenny, my mom's name was Vera. And Vera and Jenny were very close when they were kids. My mom was six years older than Jenny. And Jenny lived in New York and my mom lived just outside Chicago. In the summers, my mom used to take the train out from Chicago to New York so she could babysit Jenny for a few weeks every summer. And they became really, really close at that time. They both shared a love of acting and of theater. Uh, my mom was into theater her whole life and Jenny from a very young age realized that that's what she wanted to do with her life as well. So when my mom would go out there to to babysit Jenny in New York, um, they would put on plays. They would write scripts and come up with costumes and, and just have the absolute best time performing that. So my mom and Jenny shared that love in, uh, of theater and they also just were just totally crazy about each other. They just loved each other. Jenny, when she was, she, she took acting lessons when she was a little kid and voice lessons and everything else. And she was literally discovered when she was 16 years old. You hear about like uh, Lana Turner getting discovered when she was having a, uh, a soda in the, the, uh, the drugstore. That's literally what happened to Jenny. She was discovered by Vincent Minnelli, a, a film director named Vincent Minnelli, who was Liza Minnelli's father and Judy Garland's husband. This is a story that was in the newspaper in 1957 about Vincent Minnelli literally discovering Jenny. Uh, he had been, he was in New York and he just stopped in a, in a uh, acting class that a friend of his was running and he saw this, this girl up there, this 16 year old girl up there, Jenny Maxwell, and he just thought she was absolutely incredible. So he flew Jenny out to Los Angeles to audition for a role in a movie that he was directing called Some Came Running that starred Frank Sinatra. This says in the article, it says that it was Frank Sinatra's daughter in the movie. It was actually Frank Sinatra's aunt in the movie. So, so Jenny and her mom in 1957, when she was 16 years old, they flew out to New York. And um, I'm sorry, flew from New York to Los Angeles so that she could audition for this movie. She didn't end up getting that role, but right after that, she did end up getting a role in a TV show called Bachelor Father. And right away, even though she just wasn't the person that they wanted for the, the Frank Sinatra movie, but right away they could tell that Jenny was a star, that she had what it, what it took to be a star. And from that point on, from 1957 on, she, was, she became one of the hottest young actresses in Hollywood at that time. Get the next one here. This was the very first TV show that she was in. This was a show called Bachelor Father. And in just a little bit, we're actually gonna be seeing a clip from that. Um, and then she was in an episode of Father Knows Best and the roles just started coming one after another. She was in tons of TV shows that you probably heard of or probably remember, including Bonanza and Father Knows Best. Um, she was in a really famous episode of The Twilight Zone. Uh, and My Three Sons, um, she's in Route 66, the FBI, Wild Wild West. It was, she was in, it seemed like almost every TV show that was, that was on in the late 50s and early 60s, Jenny was popping up in there. Um, she was also in a lot of shows that you probably don't remember, like Empire and Pete and Gladys and Pony Express, which are shows I'd never heard of, but she was on those as well. Um, here's just a few other, that's her in an episode of Bonanza that she was in right there. That's an episode of Route 66 that she was in. Uh, the guy on the left is Joe E. Brown, very famous comedian. And then that's Buster Keaton on the right. So Jenny was in that one. Here's a magazine spread that Jenny was in in the uh, early 1960s as well. In addition to being in all these TV shows and, and, uh, and then eventually movies, she was also, she had her own fan club. She was in a bunch of magazines. Um, she did a whole lot of photo shoots. And her biggest break came in 1961, <clears throat> in early 1961, when she was cast in the new Elvis Presley movie, Blue Hawaii, which was filmed in Hawaii in early 1961. 
That's the role that really put her on the map. And if anybody still remembers Jenny Maxwell today, it's most likely because of Blue Hawaii. They still show that movie on TV all the time. Um, and she became extremely famous at that time. There she is again with Elvis <coughs> in the movie. There's the album cover that came out. Um, so before I, I talk a little bit more about Blue Hawaii, I just wanted to mention one thing. So when Jenny first got big in Hollywood, one of the things that the that her agent did and that the people started doing is they they started playing up two things about her which were not true. One of them was that she was Marilyn Monroe's second cousin. And in just a little bit, you're going to see a clip of Bob Hope and Joan Crawford talking about introducing Jenny on a TV show and talking about how she's Marilyn Monroe's second cousin. She was not Marilyn Monroe's second cousin. She wasn't related to her at all. Jenny's mom, Annie, actually grew up in a small town in Norway called Haugesund. And there was a guy named uh, Martin Mortensen who was rumored to be Marilyn Monroe's father, who was also from the same town. But Jenny... Uh, um, but, but there was never any proof that that was actually Marilyn Monroe's real father. Most people think that it was not her real father. And even if it was a real father, he was in no way related to Jenny's mom. But because they were both from a small town, small town in Norway, they decided they were going to play up the fact that Jenny was Marilyn Monroe's second cousin. The other thing that they played up was that Jenny was born in Norway and grew up in Norway and came to America when she was like six years old. That was not true either. Jenny grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and in fact, in her entire life, never actually went to Norway. Her mom and dad were both from Norway, but um, but Jenny was not. But it's just kind of an example of the little white lies that they tell in Hollywood to build up at that time. So um, Jenny became in 1961, when she was in Blue Hawaii, she was at that time, one of the hottest young actresses in Hollywood. The film was just phenomenally successful and her chemistry with Elvis was just great. She was um, the breakout star of that movie there and the, the movie was also famous for its soundtrack, which you see here. And one of the most famous songs, probably the most famous Elvis song of all time was Can't Help Falling in Love With You, which came from Blue Hawaii. In uh, the movie came out in Thanksgiving week of 1961, November of 1961. And it was, uh, it was, it was kind of a, just a mediocre success with the critics, but it was huge at the box office. It was far and away the number one movie that came out over Thanksgiving week that week. And the same week that that movie came out in 1961, Jenny was in an episode of Dr. Kildare which was one of the top 10 shows on TV at the time. She, she played this really attractive nurse that Dr. Kildare fell for. And so in, in um, Thanksgiving week in 1969, Jenny was in the number one movie in the country, Blue Hawaii, and she was in one of the top 10 TV shows in the country in Dr. Kildare. She was literally the hottest young actress in Hollywood at that time. So we're going to watch right now just a few of Jenny's clips of some TV shows that she was in. And also um, there's some clips in here of Blue Hawaii. So this is Jenny. Oh, it's you. What would you like to discuss, Valerie? I've changed my mind, nothing. Well, okay. I just thought there was something you wanted to tell me. I can tell you that in three words. I despise you. But Joe, right now we got a real treat for our audience. Some of the most beautiful dresses you ever saw filled to the brim with Deb stars. And the Deb stars are lovely, Bob. I know. I took a peek at them backstage. Oh, is that you on the other side of the keyhole? <laughs> <laughs> this Bitsy Blonde is Jenny Maxwell from California Studios. She has been in 30 television shows and appeared in the feature film Blue Denim. She is the second cousin of Marilyn Monroe. Kind of makes you wish you were a playwright. <laughs> I can't help it. The rag up men to go around, and here they go, wasting two at the same time. Amen. It's a woman's place to endure, Clara Lou. Well, I don't mind enduring if I got a man to put up with. Mr. Bells, you know I'd never tell Billy to do a thing like that. Who else did he talk to, Shirley? No one. He didn't talk to no one. 
He just sat up in his room all day long just talking on that toy telephone. What are you trying to do, Ellie? I did it. Well, congratulations. I didn't slide. Wait a minute. Are you trying to get us both in trouble? Do you want to kiss me again? I want you to go back to the others and behave yourself. Why? I'm afraid you might like it. I don't rob cradles. Did you ever see anything like this in a cradle? I believe you're being paid to show us a good time. When is it out? Well, the others seem to be enjoying themselves. They're a bunch of drips. Then why did you come over with them? It wasn't my idea. I've got two mothers and three fathers. You must come from a very rich family. <laughs> you're a very funny man. But you did. And where's witnesses? All right, Susie, give them their ring. And good riddance. I'd like to, Grandpa, but... Well, I can't. Why not? Yeah, why not? Well, when I, when I broke off with him, I, I took it off and I put it away. I can't. Oh, scouting parties to look over new proper freshmen. That's Harvard. First again. Harvard. Every year, the first Saturday, here they come again. Just like those... Okay, that just kind of gives you a little bit of an idea of some of the things that Jenny was in. Um, and there's one of her sultry publicity photos that she took. So before we get to the next part of the story, I just wanted to, to tell you a couple things. When Jenny moved to Hollywood, um, she pretty much lost touch with her family, including my mom, at that time. And it wasn't anything intentional. She just didn't really have any ties with the people back home. So the only news that, that my mom would ever get um, and the other cousins in the family would get is what was going on was that uh, Johnny, her dad, would go out and visit Jenny and he'd come back and he would tell Harold, the younger brother, what was going on. And then Harold would kind of report to everyone. Uh, my grandfather, Elling, he, he died in 1964 um, when I was only four years old. So we didn't get much from him, but Harold would come back and give the family kind of updates as what was going on. But my mom really never had much contact with Jenny uh, after she moved to Hollywood. And the other thing I wanted to just kind of remind everyone to keep in perspective to how different things were back then. Uh, this was in the 50s and 60s, long before the internet, long before streaming services. And when you were on TV, there were only three channels, ABC, NBC, CBS. When you were on one of those shows, everybody in the country was watching you at that time. So the fact that Jenny was on so many TV shows back then, she was it's just hugely famous because there weren't many options for people to watch on, on TV. So she's popping up in another show every month or so, in addition to movies like, like Blue Hawaii and Take Her, She's Mine, uh, which was a movie with Jimmy Stewart. So that just kind of gives you a, a little bit of perspective on how famous that she was at the time. Now, when I was a kid, Jenny, her movie career, her Hollywood career, as you're about to find out, ended in 1968. It only lasted 10 years. But when uh, when I was a kid, I had, and, and even, even in my, my later years, I really had no clue. My whole family really had no clue just how many TV shows and things that she had done. All we ever really heard is that she was in Blue Hawaii. And there was another movie called Blue Denim that she did in the 50s. Um, we had no idea that she was on all these TV shows. The this was long before the internet, so we weren't able to look up and see what TV shows she was in and everything. So I first started looking into her story and researching her life story and looking at all the, the credits that she had. Uh, we just had no clue. My mom, I don't think even think had any, any clue back then. I do remember when I was a kid watching an episode of Bonanza that she popped up in, but that's the only other thing other than Blue Hawaii that I ever saw. So Penny in the 1960s was just hugely famous. She was an, an enormous movie star. A lot of that was due to Blue Hawaii. So on the screen, her, her career and her life could not have been going better, but off screen things could not have been going worse for her. She, oh, I'm, I just wanted to show you more things. These are just a few other articles that she was in, um, in addition to all the TV things. She did all these beauty articles as well. This is one talking about her hair and complexion um, this is one that uh, talks, this one actually centers on the fact that she had so much training before she became an actress. 
Here's one that was in the Chicago Tribune. Where she was talking about how you can make your feet as pretty as your hands. And I found this interesting because in one of these articles it had the thing I was talking about earlier, the lie about her growing up in Norway. This was in one of the articles and none of this is true here. I, I think the fact she's five foot two is true, but nothing else was true. She didn't come over here from Norway when she was six years old. She was also not a powers child model either. So this was just another example of the little white lies that they would tell in Hollywood to kind of build her up. So she had all this stuff going on. She was in all these TV shows and all these movies. She was in these beauty publications and her own fan club and was in magazines and all this stuff. That part of her life couldn't have been going better. And her, her life off the, the stage though could not have been going worse. This is a guy named Paul Rapp, who was Jenny's first husband in 1957 as she went to Hollywood. She was 17 years old. And um, she, right after she got out there, she married, when she was 17, she married Paul Rapp, who was an assistant film director who was six years older than she was. Two years after she married Paul Rapp, she had a baby, Jenny, or uh, Brian, when she was only 19 years old. So she became a wife at 17 and a mom at 19. And she wasn't prepared for either one of them. And she was really bad at both of them. When she went off with the, when she married Paul, they eloped to Yuma, Arizona, which was where it was kind of like the Las Vegas of the time out there for weddings. People you could get a really quick marriage out in, in Yuma, Arizona. So that's where Jenny and Paul eloped. So she got, uh, she had Brian in 1960, little Brian, and her marriage was just absolutely awful. She was a bad, it was a bad marriage and she was really bad at motherhood too. Two years later, they ended up getting divorced. Jenny, um, this was from uh, 1962. Uh, she got divorced from Paul. And as you see in the article here, it was not a, it, it was very acrimonious. And uh, Jenny ended up getting, originally ended up getting um, custody of Brian. But she was such a bad mother that two years later, she ended up losing custody of Brian after that. She had just totally fallen victim to the Hollywood lifestyle of partying and drinking and drugs and having affairs. And she was such a horrible mom that the courts actually took her son away from her. So Jenny had a decision to make in her life. Uh, her career was starting to... to it, after this, all this stuff happened, her career actually started to go downhill. And she made the decision in 1968 that she was going to quit Hollywood altogether. She didn't feel that she could be both a good mom and a star. And she decided she was going to choose trying to be a better mom. So she thought the only way she could do that was by quitting Hollywood altogether. So uh, at the age of 26 years old, Jenny quit Hollywood. The very last thing she was ever in was an episode of the Wild Wild West uh, with Robert Conrad. And after that, she gave it up. And she was going to try to do what she could to win back at least partial custody of her son so she could start seeing Brian again. And that's what happened. She ended up getting um, partial custody of him back and her life started getting, and that part of it started getting back on track. She also realized that she did not want to get a real job. She really liked kind of still the, the Hollywood type lifestyle. Uh, she didn't want to get a real job. What she wanted was a, a rich husband. So she found this guy, the guy in the middle there, whose name is Irvin Tip Raider. He was 20 years older than Jenny, and he was a celebrity divorce attorney in uh, Hollywood. And Tip had a very interesting background as well. He had, Jenny was his fourth wife. He was a former cop who had become a lawyer when he was 40 years old and it quickly rose through the ranks to become one of the most famous divorce lawyers in Los Angeles. He was really good friends with Rob Shapiro, OJ Simpson's attorney. They, they practiced law together at the time. But Jenny decided that in 1970, she didn't want to go get a real job. She wanted a rich husband. So she married Tip Raider. Tip Raider was obsessed with Hollywood. He wanted some Hollywood arm candy as his wife and, and Jenny fit the bill there. So it's kind of marriage of a marriage of convenience for both of them. But their marriage was absolutely awful. It was absolutely terrible. They did nothing but fight all the time. They had affairs on each other all the time. They, uh, like I said, they were fighting constantly. Tip would kick her out of the house. Uh, she 
filed for divorce several times. It was just a terrible, terrible, terrible wedding or terrible marriage. She did though realize that if she, at some point an attorney told her that she needed to stay married to Tip for 10 years. Cause if she stayed married to him for 10 years, the way the law worked in California, she would be entitled to half of everything that he had. And Tip was a really rich guy at the time. So Jenny decided she was gonna try to stick it out for 10 years to stay married to, to Tip and she did it. She made it to 1980, she made it to late 1980. Finally, then she filed for divorce. She got her own place on Holt Avenue, Beverly Hills. She got a condo there and she moved out. Jenny in when she was living with Tip at the time, this is in the late 1970s. This is Jenny and her father, Johnny, and her son, Brian, in the late 1970s. So Jenny's marriage was terrible, but her relationship with her family had totally been repaired. She and Brian were great friends. She was only you know, 19 years older than, than uh, he was at the time. They ended up being more friends than they were mother-son, but she just had an absolutely great relationship with the both of them. So on June 10th, 1981, you see in the article here, Jenny and Tip were gunned down in Beverly Hills and killed. Now, what I remember about this is I was a junior at the University of Michigan at the time, and I was working on the student newspaper, the Michigan Daily at the time. This was long before you could just go online and find articles about anything. And, and we didn't know this happened until two days after the murders. My mom had gotten a call from one of her cousins in Norway, a woman named Venki, who had heard from Uncle Harold that Jenny had been murdered. So Harold started calling some of the other brothers and sisters. The word got to Venki. Venki over in Norway called my mom and said, oh my gosh, Jenny has been killed. She's been murdered. We don't have any details. We don't know anything as to what happened, but Jenny's been murdered. And um, we don't know what happened. We, th we think that her husband was killed with her, that they were gunned down. We don't know what it was. So I was the only thing in the newspaper, or in the, the only thing in the family that, that even remotely re resembled a journalist. I was a sports reporter for the Michigan Daily at the time. I said, well, let me see what I find out. So I called the Los Angeles Times because I knew that they probably had a library there that had issues of the paper from the last few days. So I called there and I asked to speak to someone in the library and I asked them if they could look up and see if they had done a story about this. And the woman there was very nice and she found this story that I'm showing you here that was in the newspaper on June 11th, 1981. And she read me this story over the phone. And then I called my mom back and I said, this is what we know. And I read the story. Now there are a few interesting things in the story that I wanna point out. One of them is that what is very remarkable to me is that in this story here, there is no indication in there of who Jennifer Rader really was. It didn't say that Jennifer Rader was really a very famous former actress named Jenny Maxwell, who just 20 years earlier was probably the most famous actress, young actress in America. 1961, she was in Blue Hawaii, was on top of the world, and this is 1981. So the fact that when they did this article, they had no clue who Jenny Maxwell really was is just remarkable to me. And the second thing is that it says in here that it was probably a the result of a botched robbery attempt. From this point on, from the time that this article was published in 1981 until I started looking into it almost 40 years later, this was the story that was out there about Jenny Maxwell, that she died in an apparent robbery attempt. And this was really all that my family ever knew. It's all that her fans ever knew about there. There have been there are books out there about Jenny Maxwell. There are websites and Wiki, her Wikipedia entry and her internet movie database entry. Everything in there says the exact same thing that's in this article here from 1981, that this was a result of a botched robbery attempt. And that's all we ever knew. We thought the rumor that was going around in my family was that somehow it maybe had something to do with the mob. We knew that Tip had, there was a big rumor that he was connected to the mob in LA somehow. We thought that maybe it was a mob hit or something like that. But we had no idea 
other than what's in this article as to what really happened uh, to Jenny. So this went on through the years in my family and, and no one really knew anything at all about it. Um, if we fast forward now to late 2018, early 2019, I just, for whatever reason, I kind of got it in my head that I wanted to look into this story. I wanted to see, I, I didn't think it was ever solved, but I wanted to see if maybe I could um, find somebody who knew something. Kind of my, my goal was maybe to convince the police to reopen the case, that I could find out something and get a hold of somebody in Los Angeles and convince them to reopen the, the case. So I decided that I was going to try to find out what happened. This is the murder scene. They were both gone down right outside this condo in 1981. Um, so the first thing that I did as I, I asked my mom, the, the, other, the other reason that I really wanted to look into this is that my mom at the time, um, late 2018, early 2019, her, her health was starting to fail a little bit. And I wanted to maybe see if I could find out what had happened to Jenny because it had been the kind of a thing that had always weighed on her heart her whole life that she never had any closure and I was able to find out with what happened to Jenny. She felt horrible that she had lost touch with her so many years ago. And then, cause they were so close when they were kids and she just, um, that's a tip. She just thought that maybe, um, I thought that maybe I could find out something and, and hopefully get her some closure. So that was kind of one of the things that was going through my mind when I, when I decided to look into this. So the first thing I, that I did is I just asked my mom to tell me everything she could remember about Jenny and, and what Uncle Harold had said and what the other uncles had said, anything that she had heard. Uh, I talked to my uncle, my mom's brother, um, who's a bit younger than my mom, and asked him everything that he ever remembered about it. I wanted to get as much stuff as I can. And then I just started looking all over the internet to see what I could find, anything at all, anything at all. I was just trying to look for anything. The first kind of a big clue that I got was I tracked down this woman who was Jenny's best friend in the 1970s, <clears throat> excuse me, right before the murder happened. And she was able to fill in a, a lot of the blanks. She told me a lot. She told me a whole lot about Jenny's life in Los Angeles at the time, which I didn't know. Give me a whole ton of information. Um, she also is the one that told me a lot about how horrible her Jenny's marriage with Tip was at the time. The next big clue that I got was I contacted a guy named John Dial, who was the first cop on the scene when the murders happened. He was the one who was quoted in one of the newspaper articles. And John Dial told me a lot of information about, uh, he, he was only on the case for one day, but he told me a lot of information about what he saw that day and how the case, he had no idea what happened with it how the case might have been investigated. Um, he, he filled in a lot of the blanks too. Then the biggest break that I had was my mom and Jenny. That's my mom and my brothers and my brother and my sister, my mom Vera. The biggest break that I had came when I got a hold of a guy. I called the, the, the Wilshire Division Detective Bureau. I found out they were the ones that investigated the case. I called there and talked to some guy, some young guy. He was in his 30s and he wasn't even born when the murders happened. I told him who I was. That I was related to Jenny Maxwell, who was killed in 1981. I said, I'm wondering if there's a you know a file on this, if there's anything at all uh, about this. He said, well, I've never heard of this, this case, but it sounds really fascinating. So let me see what I can find out. So he spent an entire day looking through boxes of files that had not yet been digitized. Uh, he found one from 1981 and just went through there and he sent this to me. He said, well, I found the file. There's not much in it. It just has some of the preliminary information in there, but it has on here the names of the two detectives that it was assigned to, Thies and Rogers. I said, all right. He said, he said they would have been the ones, if you can get a hold of them, they would have been the ones who investigated the case. They wouldn't, they wouldn't know what's going on. So make a long story short. I found out that Rogers was a guy named Jerry Rogers who had passed away a long time ago of a heart attack. But Mike Thies was still around. Mike Thies was the lead detective on the case and he was still around. And I tracked down Mike Thies. It was not easy, but I got a hold of him. I 
sent him an email, told him who I was. He emailed me back. We set up a time to talk on the phone. And over the phone, he told me what happened. And I'm not going to tell you everything because it's, it's a very complicated thing and you're going to have to read it in the book. But Mike Thies told me what happened. He said, yeah, we actually solved that case about 10 days after the murders happened. And we know what happened in there and nobody ever reported on it. You know, I, we weren't going to tell anyone uh, what happened. We didn't feel that was our job, but we solved that case about 10 days after it happened. And the truth had been sitting in the, the file in, in Los Angeles all that time. So he told me over the phone, this is February of 2019. He told me over the phone what happened. And I was able to tell my mom and my brother and my sister, I was able to tell my mom about a week before she passed away what had happened to her cousin, Jenny. And I know that she was able to finally have some peace in her heart to what happened after that. So um, after that, I had a decision to make. I said, okay, I've got this information now. I really wanna find out more about it. So my mom, my mom died in, in February of 2019. So about three months later in, in uh, May of 2019, I took a trip out to Los Angeles and I set a time up to meet with Mike Thies, the detective. We met at a coffee shop about a block away from the murder scene, which you see here. And he, by at that point, he had um, retrieved a copy of the, the final police report and he wasn't able to show it to me because that would have been against the rules, but he was able to tell me everything that was in there. So I took all the notes, I wrote everything down and then we walked over to the murder scene and he showed me everything that happened here everything that happened outside the, the murder scene in the day of it and how he investigated it. The door was closed, locked, so we weren't able to get in there, but he was able to take me all around the murder scene and show me everything that happened. The other thing that I did when I was out there is I stopped in and knocked on the door of Brian Rapp, Jenny's son. This is Brian in his apartment in Santa Monica. Um, I just had found his, I, I couldn't find any email or phone number for him, but I, I looked up his address. I was able to find Brian's address and I knocked on the door, went inside and told him who I was. And he had no clue that I existed, that his mom even had a family, didn't know anything about any of us. But I sat down with Brian for about three hours and he told me all about his mom's life. If you look at Brian, right, uh, his, his right knee, if you look right above that, you'll see on the wall of his apartment there is a poster for Blue Hawaii on there. But the, this is the only time in, in, um, in Brian's life he'd ever met somebody from his mom's family, and that was me. So we were able to talk for about three hours or so. So anyway, this is now middle of 2019. I've got all this information uh, floating around in my head, and now I needed to decide what I wanted to do with everything, because I thought it was a really amazing story. I was able to find out from my mom's benefit what happened to Jenny, and I just didn't really know what to do with us at the time. Um, I do make documentary films. I'd never done anything like this before, but I was wondering, should I make a documentary about it? Should I write a, like a magazine story, try to get that published? Uh, should I write a book? You know, if I should, what kind of book should I write? I didn't really know what to do with it. Um, it was a conversation with my my friend Brian Kruger, who's my documentary filmmaking partner. I've been talking to him a lot about everything and kind of going back and forth. And he's the one who really convinced me that I needed to write a book and that I should do it in the style of a, a novel based on a true story. So it wouldn't be a journalistic book where everything in there could be verified and all that. It would be a novel based on a true story. And to do this, I would have to you know, research as many of the things and, and, and go on, on the information that I knew to be true, write as much of that as I could. But I would also have to create all the dialogue in there, the, you know, the dialogue between Jenny and Paul and between Jenny and Tip and all the, all the other, between Jenny and Frank Sinatra, everything in there. I would have to, to imagine what they were saying at the time. I would have to imagine situations I knew that Jenny's, her, that her favorite actress was Audrey Hepburn. So I had to imagine a scene where Jenny would, and her mother went into New York City to see Roman Holiday, this movie that starred Audrey Hepburn that came out at the time. So in order to do this kind of book, I was gonna have to step way outside my comfort zone. I'd never done anything like this ever in my life, written a book like this. 
through the newspaper and the Livingston Post, I'd written a million things before, but it's so totally different than writing a book. So it was my friend Brian who really convinced me that I needed to, to do that. So then it was just a matter of finding the time when you're going to write a book. One of the things I found out is that writing a book is exhausting. It's extremely hard. And it's so much different than writing for the newspaper. Because when you write something for the newspaper, it takes you maybe an hour or two and you're done. Then you move on to the next thing. Writing a book seems like it just never ends. It takes forever. So I had to find the time to do it. And I found the time because of the quarantine last year. It was last April when we were all forced to be in our house every single day that I finally decided, I'd, okay, this is the break I need to be able to write the book. So my life last uh, April and May and even into June was I would, I would work during the day, I would do my job during the day, and then usually every afternoon, my wife and I, and sometimes our kids, we, would, we, would, uh, we had to go out and get exercise. We would take a three, four or five mile hike on the Potawatomi Trail that kind of cleared my head. So we would every single day go hiking on the Potawatomi Trail. And then I would come home that night and just sit in the recliner and I would write a chapter of the book. I would research what happened and I would write a chapter of the book. And right around that time, I brought my friend Maria Stewart, who's the publisher of the Livingston Post, my good friend. I brought her into the process. I said, would you mind giving me some feedback and maybe even some editing of the book here? So I would do a few chapters at a time and I would send them to Maria and she'd give me some feedback and she would, um, and then she actually became the editor for the book when I finally put it together. So did all that. Finally in late 2020, I, I finished the book. I got it all done. I, I took off maybe a month or two in the summer because I was just exhausted from writing it. Uh, so I needed to mentally clear my mind. But, it, but by the, the end of the year, I was able to finish the book. I made the decision that I was gonna self-publish it on Amazon because Amazon makes it really, really easy through their Kindle Direct Publishing to, to publish things. Um, so I decided I was going to self-publish it. That would give me total control uh, over everything. So I did that. And in early February, I published the book. And it's been out there for about two and a half, three months or so. And I've just been overwhelmed and blown away with the response that I've gotten from um, people who really seem taken with Jenny's personal story of this, this girl who was just totally not prepared for stardom in Hollywood and how Hollywood kind of spit her up and ate her, or ate her up and spit her out. Um, I, I was, there's a lot of people I think that really found a lot of interest in her story. Um, the true crime aspect of it, I think appealed to a lot of people, um, but it's gotten, it's gotten some really good reviews on Amazon, which I've really appreciated. And then it's gotten some attention on there, there was just a story that was in the Detroit Free Press yesterday. That's going to be on the in the print edition of the paper on Sunday. They did an article on it that was really that was really good. Uh, Los Angeles Magazine did an article on it, and now I've actually started getting some attention from some producer type people in Hollywood who are talking to me about maybe possibly wanting to do a documentary or something on it as well. So I don't know where it's going to go from here, but but the entire process has been. Uh, amazing to me um, and unlike anything that I've ever done in my life. It, it really started just with this thought that I wanted to try to find out what happened to Jenny and it kind of morphed into this and I was able to write my very first book and get that out there. And now this is the very first library program that I've ever done talking about the book. And uh, it's, I know we're all used to doing Zoom calls and everything, but it's still really, really strange to be on this side of it and not knowing if everyone out there is interested in what I'm saying or falling asleep or what you all are doing out there. But I'm assuming you're hanging on every word and laughing at my jokes and everything else, but uh, please don't tell me otherwise. Um, but anyway, that's really kind of the story of, uh, it's Jenny Maxwell's story. It's how it all came about, how the murder came about or how, the, how I investigated everything. Um, so before we get to questions, I did want to tell you one other thing. I, I had said in the, on Facebook that I was going to have some new revelations as to some things that have happened since the book came out. So if you read the book, if you know what happens, you find out that really what, what happened with the there is, that is it had something to do with tip. It did have something to do with tip rater in, in there. And in, in it's too complicated to even explain everything right now. But uh, it was not a random shooting. They were not just picked out. It had something to do with tip what happened in there. And when I was 
researching book, I was not able to find to locate um, any of Tip's children. I got a hold of one of his nieces who had didn't have any clue as to anything that had happened with it. I did get a hold of one of Tip's nieces, but I knew that Tip had five daughters by the three wives uh, prior to Jenny. He had five different five daughters by three different wives in there. And I didn't know anything about any of these daughters. Well, after the book came out, I was able to make contact with one of his daughters, a woman named Teresa. And then I was able to make contact with the, the husband and son of another one of Tip's daughters named um, Margaret, who passed away a couple of years ago, but her husband and her son were still around. I was able to make contact with both of them and tell them what happened. And I asked them if they knew anything about it. And they said that they did not. So it's remarkable to me that Tip Raiders, if you read the book, you'll know how important this is, the Tip Raiders' own children never knew what happened and how his dad was involved in, the, in the, his own murder and also the murder of Jenny Maxwell at the time. So all of this is making things really, really interesting. If anybody decides that they, whether it's Netflix or whoever decides that they do want to make a documentary about this. They're, the fact that all the things that are involved with Tip's children and them not knowing, never being told what happened with the murder case to me is absolutely fascinating on there. I want to, Jenny, before we get to questions, I want to just one more thing that's covered in the book here that makes this story even more fascinating has to do with an actor named Nick Adams. And you see Nick Adams on the left there, along with Jenny Maxwell. Uh, this is in an episode of the Joey Bishop show from the early 1960s. So Nick Adams was a very famous actor who in, he was in the late fifties, he was in a TV show called The Rebel. And uh, he ended up in the sixties, he was nominated for an Oscar for best supporting actor. And in, back in the fifties, he was also Elvis Presley's best friend. They hung around all the time. And Nick was um, a huge Hollywood star whose career also started to crash and burn. Well, there's a whole lot more to it, but in 1968, Nick Adams was found dead in his house. And the person who found him dead in his house was his best friend at the time, Tip Raider in 1968. And there's a lot of people who think that Tip Raider probably had something to do with Nick Adams' death. So there's this whole other element to the story that kind of comes into play here where you have uh, Tip Raider might have been involved in something way back in 1968, long before he was shot and killed himself. So all the more fascinating if anybody ever decides, whether it's me or somebody else ever decides to make a documentary about this, there's a whole lot going on with this story. So with that, I will, um, I think I probably talked enough right now. Uh, I don't know if we're going to take the whole 90 minutes or not, but um, Amber, I wanted to open it up now. If anybody has any questions, we can kind of kind of go from there. Yeah, yeah. So go ahead and enter in the chat if you have any questions. Um, you're, you should be able to type in there. If anyone hasn't yet got the book, it is available on Amazon. If you just type in Murder of an Elvis Girl, it's available there. You can get a pay of that. I think the paperback's like just twelve ninety nine, or you can also read it on Kindle. Um, that and I believe well. we also have two copies here that people can check out if they're oh, available. Excellent. Yeah. All right. You got two copies of the library. I love that. Yep. <laughs> that is great. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully, you'll get that there. <laughs> I've already started thinking about if I want to write another book, and I don't know if that's going to happen or not. But uh, <laughs> this one took a lot of time. It took a lot out of me, but it's kind of addicting too. So maybe I will at, at some point have to look into them. I'm curious to know if people that were tuning in for this, if anyone thinks that this is the kind of thing that would make an interesting uh, documentary, if anybody ever decides to, uh, to do this story. Yeah, Kat, Kathy has a question. She says, I finished the book today. Did Brian know what happened to his mom and what is he doing now? Great question. Thanks, Kathy. Um, yes, Brian knew. Brian found out. Tip's kids were never told what happened, but Brian, I did find out when I talked to Brian that he knew what happened. Um, Brian now is, he, he lives alone in Santa Monica. I'm pretty sure he lives on disability, uh, although I'm not positive. Um, he, he lives about a block 
blocked from the nation. He is, uh, one of the, the interesting things about Brian is that he did find out what happened at the time. And he said that every time he told me that he did this like well into his forties, every time he would start to feel sad about his mom, he would put on the Elvis Presley record, um, can't help falling in love with you. He would put that record on, he would listen to it, and then he would go running in the Santa Monica Mountains after that. And he felt connected because he was only 21 when his mom died. He would feel closer and connected to her at that time. So that's one of the things that he did. But um, yeah, Brian lives alone in Santa Monica. He has two, he, he was married um, way back in the 90s. He had two kids who live with their mother and their grown children. They live with their mother in New York. And I know he still sees them on a semi-regular basis. But as far as I can tell, Brian is the only other person who ever found out what happened. And Kathy, it sounds like because you read the book now, you know what happens in there. Um, yeah, he, he, he knew what happened. He knew what, who was responsible for the murder. Um, but Tip's kids never knew. Kim asks, do you continue to have a relationship with Jenny's son? And she also mentions this is a fascinating story that many people would be interested to learn about. Oh, thanks, Kim. Uh, yeah, Brian and I still text. Uh, we've called each other. We've talked to each other a few times. Um, I'm planning on going out to, I'm going to be in LA next month. And I'm going to hopefully try to stop in and see Brian at that time. But um, yeah, we still text from time to time. Um, I sent him a copy of the book. I haven't heard back, so I don't know what he's thinking about it or um yeah, what he knows. There, there, Brian is also, if there's a movie that, so, so his dad, Paul Rapp, was a film director, and he was really good friends with a whole bunch of Hollywood people, including Peter Fonda. And there's a movie, if you ever want to look it up on YouTube, called Wild Angels. It's a biker movie that, that uh, Peter Fonda is in. And Paul Rapp was the assistant director on this movie. It came out in 1965 or 66. And you can find it on YouTube if you just look up Wild Angels. The very opening scene in the movie is Peter Fonda is riding this big motorcycle through a neighborhood, and there's a little boy on a tricycle who comes out and almost runs into him there, and then they, he gets pulled away at the last time at the last second. The little boy on the tricycle is Brian. He was in that movie. It's the only movie that he was ever in. But if you want to see Brian as a five-year-old, you look in that movie. It's because his dad was the assistant director and he was good friends with Peter Fonda at the time. And, and uh, Paul Rapp is a, is a fascinating story too. His dad was a really famous Hollywood guy who was best friends with the Marx Brothers and he was the creator of the Vickersons, the radio show that later went on to TV after that. He, he knew, he was friends with Bob Hope and knew everyone. So he was kind of, the, the Raps were kind of Hollywood royalty. Any other questions? In the meantime, I can also share a link to our um, our, value, our online survey where you can leave feedback for the program. You can open that up. Yeah, I think a lot of you can find me on uh, Facebook. Um, if you you know message me if you have any questions about anything, uh, my email is stuntbuddy at mac mac dot com. If you ever have any. Um, questions about the book or anything else going on. Um, yeah, I'd love to it, and get any feedback. And if you have read it and if you want to leave a, uh, good or bad, anything you want to, any kind of review you want to put on Amazon, that would be great too. And I'll also send out a follow-up email in about the, the rest of this week. Um, and I'll share a link, um, you know, to his email and any other, you know, places you can find him. Um, and then this will be recorded. So once once that's up on YouTube, I'll send that link out as well. Yeah, and I didn't know the book was at the library, so that's great. Yeah. Get a copy if you haven't read it yet. Yeah, we currently have a little uh, book on Elvis, Elvis books, and some other like about Hollywood um, display in the in reference area. Oh, is it part of a display? Yeah, I set up a little oh, display. Cool. So. <laughs> yeah. That's very. I'm gonna have to go and see that. That's very cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's very cool. Nancy says, thanks for the talk. She, she read about it in the free press. Oh, okay. Thank you, Nancy. I'm curious about your writing process. Did, for when you did interviews, did you like um, record so you could like listen to the recordings later or did you do it by writing down? Yeah, no, good, 
good question. I no, I didn't. When I when I it, this was what was kind of difficult. When I went in and knocked on Brian's door there, I wasn't planning on like interviewing him. I just wanted to meet him and see if he was there. And then we just started talking. So I had a, a an envelope with me because I had a picture that I gave Brian and an envelope with me that I wrote a few notes on as we were talking there, but I didn't record anything, didn't do all that. I just wanted to get as many of the facts down as I possibly could. So I had this envelope that was filled with notes after the fact. And when I interviewed Mike Feast, when I sat down and talked to him, the, the cop who investigated it, I did have a notebook for that. And I took a lot of notes um, and everything there. And then the other research that I, the other, the only other really interviews that I did was I, I talked to my uncle, my uncle Norman, who's um, uh, my mom's younger brother, uh, you know, talked to him to get as much information as I could. And then the rest of it was just doing in, in research and everything on the internet. This, this book would not have been God bless the internet. It would not have been possible to do this book without, I couldn't have done this 30 years ago because I, I lived on newspapers.com when I was researching this, I just lived on newspapers.com. And I was, I would comb through everything and not only all the information about Jenny and her life and everything, but if I wanted to, to write a scene where she was in my three sons at the time, I would try to find out as much information as I could about uh, that show, who directed it at the time, uh, to find out information about that guy so I could get all that information. So without, without newspapers.com, without the internet, it would have been impossible to do this. And I also, I never would have had a clue to, to be able to see all the things that Jenny was in. And a lot of the, the, the clips that you saw, the TV and movie clips that you saw in there were things that I just pulled. A lot of those are just things I pulled off YouTube and other places that are out there. There's sort of a lot of her things. I'd, I've been looking forever to find the episode of My Three Sons that she was in, which is one of the um, is one of the last things that she did. I found almost every TV show that she ever did other than that episode, and it was one of her biggest roles. And finally, about two months ago, somebody put a ton of episodes of My Three Sons on YouTube, and I was able to find that one and upload it. So it was really cool to be able to see that one. Yeah, that's amazing. Kathy says, thanks, buddy. This was an intriguing read because of the connection to your family and also the history of the time in Hollywood from an inside perspective. Thanks, Kathy. Yeah, yeah Hollywood was a, it still is now, but it was a pretty incredible place back then. And, and knowing all the people whose lives she intersected with, all the famous people, you know, like, well, you saw Bob Hope on there and, and, and Frank Sinatra and Jimmy Stewart. And, um, just, yeah, she, she was also really good friends with Sharon Tate, who was one of the victims of the Manson family murders. Um, in there, they had become friends when she was in the movie uh, with Jimmy Stewart, Take Her, She's Mine. Sharon Tate was dating one of the guys who was in the movie, and then she and Jenny became friends at that point. Oh, yeah, her, her life just, and we never had a clue about any of this, just her life intersected with all those famous people. Any other questions before we wrap up? Uh, Kim says, thank you for having the tenacity to finish the story and share. I remember seeing Blue Hawaii at the Saturday movies as a kid and remember Jenny in the film. I look forward to reading the book. Oh, thanks, Kim. Yeah, most people who know Jenny or remember or see her now, it's because of Blue Hawaii. All right. Well, if there's no questions, I can start wrapping up um, and make sure you uh, fill out that survey if you have time, and I'll send that out in the follow-up email as well. Um, but thank you so much for sharing about the Jenny Maxwell case with us. Um, Buddy's book is available to check out from the library's catalog, like I said. And thank you all for t attending tonight's program. We hope you enjoyed it. Please take a few minutes to tell us what you thought about this program in the short event evaluation linked in the chat. Visit our website, www.howellibrary.org to discover more upcoming events from the Howell Carnegie District Library. Good night, everyone. Thanks, everyone.